We're God's Church of Love Online, and we are getting ready to read Romans chapter 8. We are not to fear, no matter what goes on, fear not. All right, starting at verse 15. Again. <laughs> For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. That's another way of saying Daddy. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so, be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who had subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit or to know the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Let me explain that one real quick. You see this cup of coffee in my hand? All right. When I want a cup of coffee, I don't have to hope and pray for a cup of coffee. I see it. It's right here. The coffee's in the cup. And all I have to do is sip. Coffee's right there. So why do I have to hope for a cup of coffee? That's what that means. When you can see it, when you got it, when it's within reach, you don't have to hope for it. You see it coming. But what you hope for is what you cannot see. If we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. All right. So likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. There will be times, especially in these last days, you're going to experience it more and more, where you will be praying and you wonder why the tears are coming. Why are you crying from the pit of your gut? What is this coming from? It's called travailing in the Spirit. And when you're travailing in the spirit, you could be praying for one person out there that's 5,000 miles from you. You have no idea who they are, but the Holy Spirit will have you zero in and pray for that one person. You're interceding and you have no idea what you're saying or why or about whom. So sometimes you'll do that in tongues and sometimes you'll do it in just tears and groaning in your spirit. Go with it, even if you don't understand it. Go with it. God is using you on behalf of someone else. All right. Now, he could even be using you on behalf of yourself for something that's coming down the pipe to prevent it from harming you. All right. Just wanted to explain that because sometimes we don't really all understand how the Holy Spirit works. Okay. So I'm going to read that again. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed 
to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. But what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is it that condemneth? It is Christ that died, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. You got the best one praying for you. You know that? Jesus Christ himself. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. See, some of you guys, you hear the news. You hear what's going on. You see what's going on. You see the, the, the uh, demonstrations. You hear the stuff that's going on in Israel. You hear what's going on in, in, in Chicago. You, so much going on right now. What Andrea just prayed about, the Christians going through all that just to get food and drink to find out there is no food after walking that far. People are in desperate need, you guys. We don't even have the half of what's really going on because we're in America and our hardship is a honeymoon compared to some of these other countries. So we are blessed. No matter how hard it gets, we're still blessed. Even if we sleep in a car, we're blessed because we have a car to sleep in, not a box. Big difference. Yeah, I lived in the car. That's how I know. So what I'm trying to tell you is no matter what goes on, God is on our side. You see, here's the problem with a lot of, a lot of God's people. There's a lot of fear. And when there's fear, we either avoid or we turn a deaf ear, or we occupy ourselves with fun things because we don't want to deal with the stuff that's going on. But here's a reality check, as the kids say, news flash. Crap is hitting the fan. Now, you can either ignore it and be swept away by the torrential uh, tidal waves and the tornadoes and all the things that are going to blow here and blow there and, and, and cause all kind of havoc. Or you can prepare yourself. When you prepare yourself, you're not as given to the elements as you are when you don't prepare yourself. See, God wants his people to be prepared. Now, you're going to have to prepare through prayer. Whether you want to pray or not, you're going to have to. That's the bottom line. You're going to have to get into God's word and remind yourself, renew your mind, remind yourself of all the miracles of all that God can do. And then open up your mind to even other miracles you've never heard of that you can think to ask God for, to protect you and your family. But the bottom line, you guys, is you must watch and pray. This is going to be a very basic message because you want to hear the, the fireworks and the and the rockets shooting to the other planets. No, right now you got to deal with what's going on right in your own bedroom, in your own house. 
You have to deal with the basics. Sometimes when things get beyond us, when things go beyond your pay grade, you got to get back to the basics, get back to the manual. You got to go back to the elementary stuff. That's your foundation. All the other stuff can be fluff, can be it, it, the extras, the cherry on top, the whipped cream, all the sprinkles and the goodies. But we need the basics. And some of you are not doing the basics. Some of you are not seeking God's face about what he wants you to do. Some of you are not seeking God's face about how to prepare for what's coming. For what's coming down the pike in these last days. Some of you are not reading God's word to get yourself in line with his will so that the blessings will come with more ease. See, I don't know if you ever listened to T.D. Jakes, but I remember I heard a sermon by him one time. He said, when you're waiting for God to do something, to bring something into your life, you have to position yourself to receive it. If somebody tells me, if Lynette tells me that she's got a $5,000 pack of bills in her hand, that somebody gave her $50,000, and she wants to give me 5000 but she can't get to me. I have to get to her. Then that means if I'm going to get it, I got to get in my car. I got to drive to the city where she lives. And I have to follow her directions to get to where she is so she can get the money, the cash money, in my hand. Think about it now. I have to reposition myself. I can't sit up here in my city and say, well, Lord, bring the money, bring the money, bring the money. No, I have to get in my car and go to where it is to be able to receive it for the transfer. God wants to do a transfer in many of our lives in many different ways. You know what your transfer is, what you're waiting on. I'm not even going to name any of it. But the bottom line is, my question to you is, are you positioning yourself or are you repositioning yourself? See, now, if Lynn wants to invite me over for dinner, guess what? I got to get to her house to have the dinner. I can't sit at my table, fork and knife in hand, with my plate sitting in front of me, waiting for her to serve me dinner and she's down there in her city she's uh 70 miles away 80 miles away from me and i'm up here like an idiot waiting for my food i'll go hungry waiting won't i you see when you're asking god to do stuff for you you must ask him to help you know what to do to position yourself to receive what he has for you. Some of you, it's not a physical repositioning. Some of you, it's a mindset that you must shift. Once you shift out of your mindset, the blessings will come with much more ease because you're in the way of your own blessing. Some of you, you have to shift your attitude. Some of you have to shift yourself in the spirit. You live too much in the flesh and you've got to make a shift. you got to bring about a change. Some need to go all the way back to basic repentance. Repentance means change. You do an about face. I've been living like this. Now I got to turn my back to what I've been living and go a whole different direction in order to line up with what God has for me. I told you, this is very basic. This ain't no hallelujah message. But some of us are not doing the basics. Some of us are trying to shoot to the moon, but we don't even understand the physics of fighting gravity. We don't understand the momentum of what happens once we get into the 
third atmosphere, this uh, before we even get into space. We don't understand all the dynamics because we're not doing what it takes to learn it. We want to jump from kindergarten to junior college, and we haven't gone through junior, junior high school, high school. We haven't gone through any of that. But we want to go from first and second grade, and we want to jump to junior college or to the university. You're not ready for the university. Get the basics under, under your hand first. Get that together. See, there are many born-again Christians I know from way back in the day that were out there trying to be a guide to the blind out there trying to help this one get their act together and help that one get their act together. This stuff was, their diaper was messy. And they're trying to teach everybody else how to get a degree, how to make great exploits in life. And they haven't learned how to clean their own diaper. They haven't learned the basics of how to take a good bath. They haven't learned the basics of basic grooming. Now, it sounds like, okay, where's she going with that? What I'm trying to say is don't be the blind leading the blind. Not in this day and age. Get yourself engrossed in that word. Saturate yourself in God's word. Teach yourself. Prepare yourself for what's coming. That word will strengthen you better than food will. I'm telling you, the more you know God's heart, the stronger your faith will be to ask for the impossible. But you got to get to know him. Before you start getting all your suitcases out and opening up all your treasure chests saying, okay, fill me up. No, you got to get to know who you're talking to first. Do you understand what I'm saying? Some of you wouldn't know God if he walked up and slapped you in your face. Some of you wouldn't know him if he walked up and hugged you. You wouldn't know him because you're too busy trying to do the great things. You're too busy trying to think grandiose things about yourself and Look how wonderful I am. Look how God's going to use me. And he, he needs me to do this and do that, do the other. No, God might be telling you, no, 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 baby. Uh, uh. When you went to the bathroom, you didn't even wipe. How am I going to use you over there when you can't even take care of your private business? Some of y'all got private stuff in your flesh. You are not dealing with. You excuse it. You tolerate it. But other people have to suffer through it. Do you hear what I'm saying? You have to be, when God calls you to be a leader, the first thing you have to learn how to do, baby cakes, as much of a leader as you want to be, is follow. That means if someone gives you godly advice, you take it and you do it. That means if somebody gives you a word of correction, you receive it without the attitude or you get over yourself and go on and handle it. You see, this is not the day and age for the giants to jump forth and, 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 and change the earth movers and the world shakers. Some of you want to be all that in a bag of chips and you don't even know how to open the bag of chips. But you want to be all that. I think what I'm really trying to say is ask God to help erase your pride. Pride is so subtle. And we don't realize God will not be able to use us the way he wants to use us until we get over our pride. Some of us have insecurities, but we've got big egos, and the big egos compensate for the little insecurities. But it's the little insecurities, the little foxes that spoil the vine. And you're trying to be anointed over here, anointed over there, and you're doing this, and you're doing that, and you're handling that person's life, and handling that person's life, and you're giving out advice, and you're counseling, and you're praying, and you're 
You're doing everything under, under the sun. But the very thing God told you to do about your own dirty diaper. God doesn't need earth movers and world shakers. He needs followers. And before you can lead, you got to follow, baby. You got to learn to listen. I know it ain't exciting. This ain't about all the exploits you're going to do in life, all that God's going to do in your life, and the grandiose, important things that make you shine like a star. No, this ain't the entertainment industry, y'all. It ain't about that. We must decrease. Decrease, y'all. That includes your pride. We must decrease so that he may increase. The more you smell yourself, baby, the less God can use you. That's right. As much as you think you're all that, you're so necessary to this fallen world. No, God doesn't need you, sweetheart. He doesn't need me either. It's by his grace that he chooses to use. But if you haven't learned to follow, I can't even sing that song, our day will come. Because for some of you, your day will not come. See, the Bible says many are called, many, 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 M-A-N-Y, many are called, but few are chosen. It also talks about how uh, I don't want to be one of those, I'm, I'm loosely paraphrasing this one. I don't want to be one of those that, that win this one and win that one and raise that one up from the dust and I'm rescuing all these people and then I become a castaway. It can happen. After you've done all your exploits for the Lord, you can end up being a castaway. Why? Because you won't handle you. If you won't handle you, baby, you're in a dangerous position. God wants you to handle the man in the mirror, the woman in the mirror, before you start looking at what everybody else needs. I could be looking at, at Sister Appleseed and, 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 and Brother Potato Bag and say, you know what, hey, you know, they need to get that together. God's not going to do that with them if they don't get that together. God's not going to do that with her if she doesn't get that. See, no, no, no. God can't be bothered with people like that. Mm -mm. And all the time I'm pointing the finger. Look at how many fingers are pointing back at me. No, you cannot be judgmental. You cannot be critical. You cannot be uh, uh, full of yourself. You just can't do that. You can't be a big eye looking at a bunch of little yous. See, I. Uh, uh. You have to be careful with that. Now we know that things are going down. We know things are coming down the pipe. And you have to remind yourself what the Bible says. You're more than conquerors. No matter what happens, nothing can separate you, not even you, from the love of God. But he'll love you all the way to hell if you choose to go that route. So, yeah, nothing can separate you from the love of God. But you can become a castaway if you're not careful. If you don't keep yourself in check and line yourself up by the word of God, by the ways of God, by God himself, you can become a castaway. Don't take that chance. Don't get so caught up in your wonderful self, in your highly anointed self, that you lose track of what God wants to do in you, with you, and through you. I remember years ago when I was unsaved. Let's talk about me. When I was unsaved, my next door neighbor came over the house. She sat down across the table. And she says, so Pat, I hear that you plan to go back to New York. Yeah. What about your father? This is my attitude, y'all. What about him? And she didn't know what to do with that. She was like, uh, well, 
you know, who's going to take care of him? I don't know. It was his job to take care of me. He did his job. Now it's my job to take care of myself. That was my attitude. Now, let me, sh let me share with you what God does when he starts to do that about face change in your spirit. He does it in your nature through his Holy Spirit. I had a fat attitude when she tried to make me think I had to put my life on hold to take care of some old man. Oh, that was my attitude, y'all. Very full of myself. I stunk. Big time. I wasn't saved even at all. Wasn't thinking about God. Didn't want to hear about God. Got an attitude about that too. But one day when I finally got enough of myself to say I need a change and I turned my heart over to the Lord, I found myself begging God, begging him, to let me take care of my father. I will take care of him till he draws his last breath. And I did it with joy. I did it with love in my heart. I enjoyed him like never before. I appreciated him. I apologized to him. I cleaned all the slate. I did everything to reconcile whatever could have done to hurt him because he never did anything to hurt me. He was a wonderful father but I was too full of me to see it or appreciate it. I was so ungrateful. It was nasty. I'm talking about me now. See, when God gets a hold of your heart and you do the first things, learning through the word, following instruction, letting yourself be mentored by someone who knows more than you do, getting corrected, that's right, getting disciplined, all of that that comes with it. Getting taught, getting encouraged, prayed for. And you allow that to happen. You humble yourself. Then you'll see the change start to take place that'll blow your own mind because now God is able to do a new work inside of you. But you got to be willing to humble yourself. You got to be willing to put you on the back burner. You must decrease so that God may increase. You have no idea what that means until you start doing it. I was doing things for my father. I pretty much almost swore I never would. The thought of it was nauseating. I had to clean him, y'all, like he was a baby. I took care of him till he died. Now, that would never have happened had I not gotten saved. Some of you, you want to do the great things. God wants you to get down to the basics. Some of you won't do things for your own family members because it's too much of a sacrifice. Some of that might have to be coming from your heart willingly before God turns you over to the big stuff. There may be jobs out there. There may be assignments, spiritual assignments God wants you to do. But he can't get you to do that until he gets you to do the first fruits. The first fruits might be the first thing that's hard for you to picture yourself doing. Laying everything aside for someone else. Oh, no. God forbid you give up your business to take care of a family member. Oh, no, I work too hard for that. And God might be saying, let go of it and you see what I'll do in your life. You willing to sacrifice? You willing to kill your son, Abraham, for my sake? You willing to sacrifice your son for me? You willing to sacrifice your business for me? Are you willing to sacrifice that position, that place that you live? You willing to sell your house? You willing to sell your car for me? You willing to cut that man loose, that relationship loose for me, for my purpose? Huh? You willing to get rid of your ego trip and that big bank account for me? You, you willing to go take care of your mama? Your brother, your father, your daughter, your sister, your cousin, your uncle, your aunt. You ready to take on that assignment for me? That's a ministry. 
Yeah. Yeah, you may be great at doing this, that, and the other, but I want you to do something basic. You're not going to make the money you're used to making. Are you willing to do that for me? See, those are the questions you got to ask yourself. Am I willing? And if you know you're not, be honest and say, Lord, make me willing to be willing. Because I'm too selfish. I don't want to give that much of myself. You know it. Annie up. Yeah, be real about it. Don't play games with God. He knows it before you ever thought of it. He can help you if you're willing to be helped. But if you want to stay that way, you'll never make it but so high in your life. I promise you that. Because God is looking for people who will forsake all for him. Forsake all. That's right. Are you willing to forsake all? Are you willing to get rid of the status quo that you have gotten so used to? Hmm? Yeah. That's hard, isn't it? It's hard to decrease so that he may increase. It's hard knowing that you got to be waking up five, six, seven, eight times a night to change somebody's diaper, to help somebody go to the bathroom, to wipe their behinds. It's hard to do that when you could be out there doing your thing. It's your thing. Do what you want to do. Yeah, that's what we do. We do what we want to do. What we don't want to do, trust me, we don't do. Unless, unless... We allow God to take control of our wants, our desires, our aspirations. And we trust him with the things we have to give up in order to do so. What are you willing to give up? What are you willing to, to what price are you willing to pay to get the most out of what you can get from God and give him the most out of what he can get from you? See, one of the highest callings that I ever did in my life, it was not prison ministry. It was cleaning my husband's behind. It was giving him bed baths. That was ministry. My ministry was to make him feel like a man when he felt like a good for nothing baby. That was my ministry encouraging him in the most holy faith, encouraging him in love. My assignment when I first got saved, it was a high calling. I had to do what it took to convince my father that I was truly saved, that there really was a God that really made a difference in our lives. And he saw his daughter not smoking. He heard his daughter not cussing. He saw his daughter not going out and partying all night. He saw me doing things for him that I he knew I never wanted to do. And within two weeks, my father gave his heart to the Lord. That was a high calling. But some of you look at that as something disgusting. You can never do that. You can never go there. Honey, you can do all things through Christ that strengthens you. But are you willing to take the leap and let him test you? Are you willing to see all that he can take you through? Are you willing to sacrifice your comforts, your freedoms, huh? your luxuries? Yeah. Hmm. See, part of the problem with us as born-again Christians, we want the honey, we want the money, we want all the goodies. We don't want the cost, we don't want the cross. That's the biggest problem with us. We don't want the cost, we don't want the cross. We want to cruise not the cross. 
We don't want to hurt. We don't want to sacrifice. We don't want to give jack. We want to get, but we don't want to give. That's right. See, a lot of you, you think you're born again. You think you are full of the Holy Ghost. You love God. You're sold out to him. Baby, if you were truly sold out to him, there's a whole lot of stuff you'd be doing that you never thought you could do. God could have been telling you to do A, B, and C. You buried A, B, and C so far behind you, you couldn't hear it if it came uh, hanging on the back of your car, clanging like a bunch of loud. No, you just cut it off, toss it in the trash, and keep on going the way you want to go. Because that ain't me. No, nah, no, nah, nah, I ain't doing that. That ain't me. It could be. If God asked you to do it, guess what? It could be, but he knows those of you who are willing, and he knows those of you who are not. Many are called, but few are chosen. I don't know what else to say, because I think the biggest problem with us as born-again Christians we want to be great. We want to do great things, but we don't want to go to the basics. We don't want to pay the cost to be the boss. You ever hear that expression? Got to pay the cost to be the boss. Yeah, God may want you to be the boss over great things, but you won't be faithful in the least. You won't be faithful in the basics. No, too much of a hassle, too much of a price, too much of an inconvenience. No, you won't go there. No, no, no. No, no, that's just not me. No, it ain't that it's not you. It's that you're not willing. That's all. There's a lot of things that we don't like to do. But when God gets a hold of our hearts and we say yes, all of a sudden the desire is there. Huh, I never thought I would have wanted to do that. And here I am making jokes out of it, laughing, enjoying and Love fest for days. There's a love fest I had with my father I would never have experienced if I hadn't been willing to clean his diaper and wipe his behind. Hmm. Yeah, I had to go down, baby, to get that high level of love in my life. Some of you will never experience that high level of love because you will never allow yourself to go down. No, no. Not me. No. No. Pray and ask God to change your heart. That's all I can ask you to do. Ask God to make you willing to do whatever it is he wants you to do. Because the highest callings are usually the things with no glory. No glory. Nobody's sitting in an audience clapping for you and, and praising God for your, for your anointing and for your ministry. You want to be great for God, but you don't want to do the basics. You don't want to do the grunt work. Jesus didn't walk around looking for people to serve him. He walked around serving the king of kings. The Lord of Lords was a server. And many of you won't serve Jack. Oh, you might run to the store and do an errand. Oh, but you ain't going to inconvenience yourself. Not like that. My question is how much of you are you really willing to give to God? Yeah, of course, you won't be separated from the love of God. But boy, oh boy, you will miss out on so many treasures. Some of the most beautiful, some of the most enlightening treasures God has for us are found in the grunt work, the times when you wished you had more freedom, the times when your life was tied up with someone else's needs. Those are moments in those areas that are difficult that you will never get in the glory. 
but you'll never experience it because you refuse. You simply refuse. Take gonna happen. Not here. Hmm. This ain't the time and I ain't the one. Thank you and no thank you. And you miss out on so much and you wonder why. Because you're not willing to pay the cost to be the boss. Many are called, but few, few, few are chosen. Oh, Father, help us. Help us understand what you really want, Lord. In Jesus' name. And give us a willing spirit, Father. 